Welcome back. In this part of the lecture, I want to talk about some of the theory behind writing history, some of the things that you need to consider to do it well. And for those of you that aren't actually completing a history degree and aren't passionate about history, you'll be very pleased to know that being able to research and write history well is useful to you pretty much everywhere. I'm hoping that you will find history interesting, and I know some of you are history buffs, but I need to point out that the skills you gain in this subject can be applied elsewhere and applied elsewhere to very good effect. And it's worth knowing that history does need to be done. There are professional historians, as I mentioned in the previous part of this lecture, and there are entities that need their histories written to give a sense of place and to connect the present with the past. And those entities which commission them are often councils, not just in written form, but if you think about the displays of history around the place that the council sponsors. So developments such as Jazine Barracks and Townsville, those things are important and Cairns often strongly connected to the tourism industry. So histories need writing for pragmatic terms and in local contexts for histories, developers, individual organisations, but all sorts of entities have a desire to have their history organised and known. That's the kind of thing that professional historians write. They're very skilled and they know what they're doing. I'm an academic historian these days, and so I have more freedom in the topics that I investigate. And these topics are important too. There are histories that need writing, I'd like to say, for humanity. I don't think I'm quite at that level. But for community, for nation, which can be problematic. And if you continue in history, you might like to consider the different ways in which historical studies are organised. So national histories, histories of Australia, are quite common, but they can exclude important factors and there are other organising principles that are possible. So those are the entities that need their history written and being able to write it means that you have skills which you can apply elsewhere. So being able to research, to look at the primary source documents and make some sense of them is really valuable. It's a skill that's used by journalists, by other forms of copywriters. So I know journalism is in decline in the present, unfortunately, but all sorts of people need to write about what they've found out. And writing history during your degree gives you really good writing skills. So those research and writing skills are applied by journalists, by public servants, and in the glam sector. Now, I wonder if glam is a term that you've come across before. It's a lovely acronym. It stands for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. So that, so that set of public history organisations. And it's, as I say, a great acronym, and they tend to also get the really good buildings because they're public facing and they do get sponsored by various levels of government. Being able to understand the past in a way that a third year history student can is also useful in historical tourism and for understanding the sites that might be promoted. Having a sense of how to unpick the past and understand what happened and what didn't happen and what might have happened and what people thought and felt about that is useful to an entertainment. You might like to consider whether any of your favorite movies, games, or television series are set in other whens, in other periods of time, and the ways in which their creators have had to establish that world in order to establish their narratives. History is good too for training your brain. It's hard. You're going to come to tutorial in the subject. You're going to engage with your classmates. And I'm hoping that we're going to have really good conversations where we find we don't agree with each other. So that process of making your point and producing evidence to support it and recognizing too when the evidence might not be conclusive is going to be really useful to you in pretty much any context. And in this subject as well, 
I'm hoping that you will go out to different sources. So certainly within the tours that we're going through, both the ones that I'm conducting and the ones that your classmates are taking us on, you'll get a sense of the wide variety of sources that are available. And I hope you've had a look at the reading that I set for this week, although it's not compulsory, because it's a lovely account of going into French court archives and the problems with using the material in there. It's engagingly written. I think it's a great deal of fun, but it also gives a sense of how records are produced unintentionally for the people who are involved in them. It discusses that, that the people who are being interviewed by police generally don't want to be interviewed by police because they wish the thing hadn't happened or because they wish they hadn't been caught doing it. So this wide variety of sources, this engagement with all sorts of different minds from different times is going to be useful to you in your lives, not just in your working lives, or I'd like to think so anyway. And what I'm getting at here, and it's something which I hope is not too much of a surprise to you at third year, is that history, while it's about the past, is not the past. History is a way of looking at and describing and engaging with the past. And as a result, it's open to constant revision and refinement. For those of you who have done my earlier history subjects, it's something that we pick up on, particularly in the HI2001 global history subject, that there are different ideas, that there have been significantly different ideas about what unfolded in the past held by different historians, either at different times or at the same time. We historians are an argumentative bunch, and so we do take each other on at times. History is not a portal into the past. It's a reconstruction of the past, and we're looking through fuzzy, badly damaged glass. If writing history were like Doing a jigsaw puzzle, we'd be in trouble. And I must admit, I enjoy doing jigsaw puzzles, which is why I've worked up this analogy. It's not like buying a jigsaw puzzle in the shop and knowing all the pieces are there. If history were a jigsaw puzzle, we'd start out by making the box in that we have to start by defining what we think we might be looking at, setting limits to it, thinking what might be there. So we have to sketch out the picture that we think we might find, so we have some clue of what we're looking for. We have to acknowledge that we're not going to know exactly ever that pieces are missing. Um, I buy my jigsaw puzzles from the op shop, so clearly I've come to terms with this idea. As a historian, if doing history were like a jigsaw puzzle, probably most of the pieces would be missing. Being an argumentative bunch, historians would certainly disagree about whether the pieces they did have actually fitted this puzzle and where other pieces might be found. We'd argue about whether this particular jigsaw is actually a good use of our time. And at the end of it, I have to admit, we never really know if we got it right. We do our best to come to terms with the past and to describe it, but ultimately, the past is gone, and we can't be certain that we understood it perfectly. I'm hoping that this does not make you gloomy about doing history. I'm hoping instead you're getting enthusiastic about getting out your jigsaw puzzles at home. But as the slide suggests, perhaps this description of doing history is an insight into your past history lecturers and history readings. Now, I said that if history were a jigsaw, we'd start by constructing the box. That process of constructing the box, deciding what the picture might be, is a reflection of the way in which history reflects the society writing it. History massively expanded after the 1960s. Before the 1960s, History tended to be political. And if you think about the histories that are written and the histories that you've done, there's a whole lot of political history there. The first year subject, 20th century world history, is or should be a political history subject. 
Australian history, because it's set by those national boundaries, also has a fair political component to it. And that's the kind of thing that used to be written before the 1960s. During the 1960s, a whole lot of other groups emerged. So you have huge social upheaval, generally triggered by wars, and different groups start to state their importance. So if you think about groups such as women, groups such as non-white people within predominantly white societies, and then further, people who are not part of the political elite, so working class people and even middle class people, they start saying that their pasts are important too. You see those social movements in the 1960s and they start to spin off new types of history. The types of histories just keep expanding. So I'm an environmental historian and environmental history traces its roots to the 1970s. And it does emerge as part of that environmental movement and about concerns about how humans interact with their environments. It's not a history of environmentalism. It's not a history of destruction. It's about how people interact. Before the 1970s, before environmental history, it was as if there were political history in a complete vacuum, as if the natural world didn't act on people. That's a slight overstatement, I'll admit, but it, it's not entirely unfair. So that expansion of historical topics in the 1960s is something that we should be extremely grateful for. And it's a sign, too, of the way in which history tends to reflect the present. So we keep on needing to write history, not because the past changes, but because our view of the past changes and we keep on needing to relate it to our present. And our present concerns dictate what parts of the past we look to and how we might interpret it to make sense of where we are now. If we accept that history and history writing reflects the society producing it, it also reflects the person writing it, the historian. Historians are, by and large, ethical creatures, and we do our very best. We try to be true to the evidence. But interpretation is an important part of writing good history, and the same piece of evidence can generally be interpreted in a variety of different ways. And so we bring our views of how events occur to our analysis. Do we see things happening because of a build-up of social forces? Do we think they happen by chance? Are we a 19th century historian who thinks that things are dictated by providence, also known as God? How do we view the past? Because it does affect how we wait the evidence we see, and how we see causes. We are moral beings, and we also bring to our work our views of what is good and what is bad. And as we get older, we do tend to get more accepting and more understanding of other worldviews. But it's a good argument for making sure that there are plenty of different types of people within the historical establishment. Because we have different worldviews, different things we're interested in, and we attach different weights to pieces of past behavior. So we bring ourselves, we bring ourselves in terms of who we notice in the past, and what we notice in the past, and what we think about what we notice in the past. And because we are moral beings, we tend to deal with the big topics. This is something that I find difficult at times. I look at the history of sport hunting. My thesis was all about killing big things in the 19th century. When I was pregnant with my first child, I couldn't handle reading about killing big things in the 19th century because the big things didn't die very readily. They go through horrible suffering and the hunters are a pack of... <laughs> So I switched my prey species and started looking at crocodile hunters in the 20th century in Northern Australia, which I could manage. I'm now past my childbearing years and I'm returning to looking at killing all sorts of things 
rather than just the crocodiles that I can cope with. And so our willingness to deal with pain, with suffering and with unpleasantness and to face up to those in the past also affects what we choose to study. And because we are moral beings, sometimes we have to put aside our moral weightings and try and bring our empathy and our imagination with us as well to understand that there are completely different worldviews. The history we write reflects us. There is no way around that. But we need to make an effort to be as true as we can to people who are different from us, who lived in the past, who had different worldviews, who behaved in very different ways and assessed their behaviour in very different ways and who had different abilities from us. And we have to try and understand them in their own terms. And then, of course, we have to communicate those understandings. And there's a wide range of ways to do that. There are traditional and familiar ways, books, articles, and then stepping away from what academic historians do. There are all sorts of other ways as well. Some people enjoy historical reenactments. Some people are able to make an historical argument using a documentary format. Some use exhibitions, and I've participated in that, and I found it difficult. The past is also communicated to us, and think about who funds these communications of the past. It's also communicated to us through monuments, and that's something that we will be looking at in this subject. And as we live in the present with the digital, ways of formatting and communicating ideas are becoming more diverse. So there are infographics, things which involve imagery as well as words to communicate quite sophisticated ideas. There are also short web-based articles, which is what you are writing for the third item of assessment. And there are videos, and there's a whole lot of history video material online particularly through YouTube. History is also communicated generally as a backdrop rather than something that's focused on through fiction. And fiction in the form of novels, television, movies, games. But as I say, that tends to be as a backdrop to the action that's taking place rather than a clear communication about history itself. And history is communicated by a range of historians. So I've identified myself as an academic historian. I started pointing to the work that's done by professional historians as well. There's that kind of popular enthusiasm for history. Those people without formal training in pursuing history, but who communicate it often to large numbers of people. And they're also enthusiast historians. So again, people without formal training in history and in history writing who are doing it because they love it or they love a particular topic. So think about all the family historians, all the people who are writing the history of a particular organisation or a particular thing that they love. And again, often they're producing their histories, not in written form, but through formats such as YouTube videos. So this, I hope, has given you something to think about, to go back and consider what you've seen already in your undergraduate degree and what you see around you in terms of history, how you think it gets written, the importance of the historian in what they produce and in what you want to produce. As I said earlier, I strongly recommend that reading, although I have not made it a requirement. I think it is lovely in terms of talking about the archives and the limit of the archives and also the enthusiasm that historians bring with them to their task and that I hope you're going to share as you work your way through this subject.